I want to share with you uh, this morning as we uh, begin a prayer request that I have never heard. I've heard a lot of prayer requests. I mean, lots of them. But this is one I have never, ever heard. Dear Lord, please help this church to grow smaller in the years to come. Dear Father, make our numbers shrink and help us to free up space in our auditorium so that there'll be a lot of empty seats in the weeks or the months uh, to come. Uh, we've had that, of course, because of the pandemic, but I've never heard anybody actually pray for the, for the church to shrink. I've heard a lot of prayers, but not that one. On the contrary, when people are praying up here, uh, and when it comes to the local church, we pray for the very opposite. Please God, more souls saved. Please God, better attendance. Please God, fill the Bible classes. Please Lord, bigger numbers in giving. Always more, right? We pray for more, for bigger when it comes to the church. And this is correct. I mean, this is correct and it's properly biblical in nature because our task is to evangelize our communities and the world in our generation. That's our, that's our task. And if we do this effectively, the results will be seen in a pattern of steady church growth. You know, some people think that it's, uh, it's unspiritual to count souls as a way of measuring successful growth. You know, you mentioned how many people you baptized or how, many, you know, how big the attendance was and there are people that go, oh, it's so uncouth, you know, it's so unspiritual. To mention numbers, it's not polite to mention numbers. Well, it may not be polite, but it's, but it's, it's biblical. It's not the only way to measure growth but it's one way to measure growth and it's a very biblical way of doing it. For example, in the book of Acts, uh, in chapters two and four, Luke, under the power of the Holy Spirit, describes the growth of the church in numbers. He doesn't say, well, they were really growing spiritually. No, 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 he said there were 3,000 souls baptized because he wanted to make sure he got across the idea that the church took off like a rocket. 3,000 souls were baptized that, uh, that day in Pentecost. And then uh, a while later, the church, grow, uh, the church grew to be 5,000 souls. Uh, there are nine other instances in the book of Acts where Luke refers to the success of the work of ministry by saying that the number of believers increased substantially. Numbers, he mentioned numerical growth as a way of measuring the success that the apostles were having at the beginning. And so judging the growth of the church by examining its numerical growth is biblical and it's necessary. And for this reason, I'd like to begin uh, my lesson this morning with a review of some statistics here at Choctaw for the last 10 years or so, and especially how the uh, pandemic has affected us in the, in, the last, in the last year. Now I promise this isn't going to be 20 minutes of statistics, but a very, you know, a snapshot, last 10 years or so of uh, Choctaw. Now you look at the top, these are the, uh, these are the headings here. And so you have the uh, Sunday morning and the year, the average you know, Sunday morning uh, attendance. And then the next uh, uh, column will be the potential attendance. There's a difference between the attendance and the potential attendance. The attendance is who came. The potential attendance is who could have come. You know, you could have a thousand members in your, in your directory of families, there's a thousand people, but maybe only 200 show up out of the thousand. So you, you've got to measure the potential. And then actual, the actual average attendance, and then the 
the percentage of the potential, meaning what percentage of the church actually showed up for worship. And then uh, the same idea for Bible class potential, actual average attendance, pot uh, percentage of potential, and then I also threw in the stats for total baptisms and uh, total uh, placing membership. So I'm not going to do 10 years, I'm just going to pick a couple of the years to show you the pattern of growth that we've had. So let's look at uh, the year 2010. 2010, we, we, we weren't calculating uh, uh, potential attendance, but we did take attendance. 279 people, that was our average over 52 weeks in 10 years, I mean in 2010. All the rest of the information we didn't have in 2010. We did take number of baptisms, there were 10 baptisms, 19 people placing membership. Then we jumped to 2015, 400 people, potential attendance. We had 400 people. I don't mean now you know, people in the directory, but who, who hadn't come to church in 10 years. I'm talking about people who, who would come you know, once a month maybe, and people who came all the time. The, the true potential was 400 people in this congregation. The actual average was 296 people every Sunday morning meaning 74% of the congregation came to church, 74%. 26% of the church every Sunday would not come for whatever reason. Some were working, some were sick, some just didn't come because they didn't want to. Uh, same idea for Bible class, same potential, 400 people. Only 178 people showed up for Bible class. 45% of the church showed up for Bible class. In 2015, 16 people were baptized, 27 people placed membership, moving right along. 2019, the last year where we really have statistics for the whole year, 350 people, our, our potential went down. We lost people. Our average attendance went up slightly to 300, but here's the key, the percentage went up. In other words, 85% of our congregation showed up for worship every Sunday, which was uh, better than back in 2010. We had less potential, but more people showed up uh, uh, for worship in 2019. Same thing for Bible class 350. Only 175 actually came to Bible class. That means 50% over a period of five years, no more than half the church would come for Bible class. I've never figured out why. I've never figured out why that is. I mean, Marty and I and other ministers, we've sat around and talked about that I don't know how many times. We can never figure out why someone would come for Bible, would come for worship, but wouldn't come to study the Bible. But that, there it is. 13 people baptized, 28 people placed membership. 2020, before COVID, 360, 298 average attendance, so we kind of held steady from the year before, 84% showed up. The rest of the information wasn't available. We had three baptisms, two placing membership. Then COVID hit. We had the same potential, 360 people. Our average attendance here, 166 people. Talk about how this pandemic affected our congregation. 166, I'm not counting the people who are watching from home. I'm talking about the people who actually came to worship here in the building. 46% of our congregation. We lost more than half of the congregation uh, who didn't come to worship. We didn't, we didn't have the numbers for Bible class because we didn't have Bible class. We had to cancel Bible class. One baptism, four people placing membership. That's in 2020. COVID, that's, that's when the COVID was happening. And then uh, this year, uh, January to March 2021, 20, uh, we still have the same potential attendance, 350, 153 average. That's why I say, hey, good morning, it's great to see you all because we've been looking at 150 people in the auditorium. 44%, less than half. Talk about a rebuilding job that's ahead of us. 
350, potential attendance for Bible class, 98 people showed up for Bible class. 28% of our congregation showed up for Bible class. No Baptists. Yeah, you notice the pattern. Nobody comes to church. Ha less than half come to Bible class. And we, yeah, we've got no baptisms. One person placing membership. So what, what's the conclusion? You know, statistics are statistics, but what, are the, what's the, what conclusion can you draw? Well, the conclusion that you can draw, looking from 2010 to 2020, is that we are static in our growth. In other words, uh, 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 we baptize and, 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 and draw in enough people to place membership in order to replace the people who leave through death, or leave because they're unhappy, or they leave because they're moving to, to, to Tulsa, or you know, or they're going to school somewhere. So we replace the people who leave. That's called static. That's static growth. So where do we go from here? Well, aside from an effort to simply bring back all of our members as the COVID situation settles down, we might also be thinking about what other churches have done to promote numerical growth. One such church was the Southeast Church in Louisville, Kentucky, and it's their story that I'd like to, to tell you about. I, I don't want to dwell on just the numbers, but I wanted to show you the numbers, because the numbers don't lie. The numbers tell us the truth. So what about this church, Southeast Church, Southeastern Church, Louisville, Kentucky? It began in 1962 as a church meeting in a local school that soon built a building and organized a, sta a, a staff similar to ours. Their auditorium sat about 550 people. They had a group of elders, deacons, and a staff of ministers and secretaries, again, much like our own. Although they identified themselves as a, quote, Christian church, they baptized by immersion for the remission of sins as we do, and they were organized as a congregation in much the same way that we are. There are many similarities between them and us, but when we look at their numerical growth, this is where the similarities end. In 1987, the Southeastern Church moved into an expanded building that could hold 2,200 people because they had been growing at a rate of 10% a year. Now, in church growth statistics, the average church growth for any church, I mean any church, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Church of Christ, any, you know, is three to four percent. That's the average growth, three to four percent. So if you're growing at a 10% rate, you're doing pretty good. And they were doing pretty good at a 10%. Once in this location, they began to grow at a rate of 40% a year, to the point that in 1998, they once again enlarged their church complex to accommodate over 14,000 people per week who attend Bible class and worship services there. Remember that this is in a place where people are used to the Bible and there is not supposed to be any room for another church, especially one this big. They're in Kentucky. It's not like there are no churches of Christ in Kentucky. You know, it's not like uh, you know, uh, our mission work in, in Montreal, we're, in a, we're a, a city of three and a half million people. There were only three churches of Christ. There was plenty of room for growth but they were in Kentucky. Remember also that this is a city that only had a population of 250,000 people as compared to Oklahoma City has a population of 700,000 people. So what do they have that we don't? Same Lord, same spirit, same gospel, same organization, same type of staff. Why them? and not us. Perhaps it's because they followed a plan of success and growth that we haven't considered yet. As I read the book and thought about our work here, I saw seven steps that they took to succeed. 
at numerical growth. Because you see, it was about numerical growth. They wanted to grow numerically. It's not that they didn't want to grow spiritually, but they focused on numerical growth. Seven steps that are perfectly in the spirit and letter of the New Testament and perfectly adaptable right here as we search to succeed in growing our congregation. Brothers and sisters, we want to grow back to what we had and beyond and beyond. So seven steps to successful church growth, very quickly. Number one, they knew and they stayed focused on their primary mission. Churches that grow need to know what their mission is, they need to be able to articulate it well, and they need to understand how everything they do fits into the basic mission of the church. So the Southeastern Church's mission statement said the following. Our mission is to evangelize the lost, edify the saved, and minister and be a conscience to our community. Can anybody disagree with that? Is there anything unbiblical about that? Every member knew what the mission of the church was, and they served and gave and planned and prayed in light of the mission. If we are to succeed, we must also clearly define what is our mission so that every member here owns the mission as their own personal goal. Step number two, they established faith goals. Now at Southeastern, they call them bags, B-H-A-G, bags. I know you're wondering what do the letters stand for bag, B-H-A-G, big, hairy, audacious goals. Not very biblical, but works for me. Big, hairy, audacious goals. I call them faith goals because they were the type of goals set by the elders that were only reachable if God's hand was at work. Do you get it? They were only reachable if God's hand was at work. They were goals that at first glance were beyond the financial, emotional, and numerical ability of the congregation. When, someone, when one of the elders went in front of the church and said, this is going to be the goal, the, the look on the faces of everyone said, are you nuts? We can't do that. Only God could do that. Yeah, that's a big, hairy, audacious goal. They were goals that depended on God's intervention and demonstrated power to reach. You see, brothers and sisters, there is no faith without risk. There is no faith without risk and there is no growth without faith. Faith goals are goals that glorify God, not the church. Many times, you know, the church doesn't know the difference between faith goals and what are simply projects. Let me explain. Redoing the bathrooms and putting down hardwood flooring in the classrooms that's a project. Uh, in the Bible talk offices, knocking down the wall and building another wall and painting and putting in carpeting and create, putting a window in and you know, carpets on the floor and making up two offices and all of that stuff. That's a project. That's a project. But hiring coal Cold Tuck, for those of you who are visitors, hiring Cold Tuck as our youth and family minister in the middle of the pandemic, that's a faith goal. See what I'm saying? Because people were saying, we're going to hire a youth and family minister in the middle of the pandemic? The churches have empty, the kids are at home. We don't know what's going to happen. This thing could go on for three years. 
And we're hiring a family and youth minister? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a faith goal. That's what that is. Painting the building, putting carpet down in the building, that's an expensive project, not a faith goal. No, you see, a faith goal would be to take 50 of our members and plant a new church somewhere in Oklahoma where there isn't one at the present time. That's a faith goal, not a project. One more example, uh, putting on a new roof uh, of this building and, and putting on a new roof of the annex was another very expensive project, but we had some pretty smart planning and it turned out that the insurance company paid for the roofing. You see, that was, that was a project and that was a smart project, but that required no faith whatsoever because the insurance company paid for it. But a big, hairy, audacious goal for Choctaw? How about we, uh, how about we buy the, we sell this corner and we buy a 10 acres that's for sale at Post and uh, Reno and we build a building there uh, uh, suitable for the 21st century church work. Now that would be a big, hairy, audacious goal. I, 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 can, all, I can already hear people thinking, is he crazy? Is he nuts? Selling this, getting rid of this, and stepping out into we, uh, what? Who knows what? You see, projects don't require faith. They just need time and money. But faith goals, especially those big, hairy, audacious goals, require that we see beyond ourselves, that we, that we try beyond our strength, that we absolutely have to depend on God to finish and uh, to succeed. Otherwise, the building will be clean and well kept, but our spirits will be stunted due to the lack of spiritual growth only produced by stepping out of the boat and walking on the water as Peter did before his lack of faith failed him. What we haven't done in 10 years brothers and sisters is, we haven't walked on the water in a long time. We've enjoyed the status quo. Step number three, they unleashed the word. They understood that in marketing terms, the product that the church has to get into the hands of the consumer is God's word. They found ways to get the word to the community outside the walls of the church building. In their case, they began using their preacher's sermon material as handouts to friends and, and neighbors. Eventually, they purchased radio time for him to preach and teach uh, uh, through this particular medium. Many who heard the teaching of the word through the radio and other forms of communication eventually came to Bible studies and worship because they wanted more of God's word in their hearts and their lives. God's word, if, re if released, will not return without a harvest. If we get the word out, God will provide the increase. Most churches spend so much of their budget uh, to hire an evangelist and another preacher, but then they confine his words to the building. That's not how you grow. Step number four, they fully empowered their staff. Their elders charted the goals, monitored the progress and provided encouragement and advice, but they allowed the ministry and support staff to do their jobs. A growing church needs the coexistence of a firm central direction on one hand 
and an environment that allows the maximum individual autonomy for the staff. In business models, they call this the loose tight, loose tight principle. The type of relationship or this type of relationship promotes personal accountability and creativity, motivation and long-term commitments from the ministry team. At Southeastern, they hired the very best people they could find at, the very, uh, at each post. They provided them with good benefits. They trusted them to do the job that they had been trained to do. And they permitted long-term commitments with very little turnover among church em uh, employees. And not just the employees, but the deacons as well. When they started to work as deacons, they stayed on for years and years and years because they followed this system. And so this consistency in staffing contributed to the amazing growth and stability they experienced. Number five, they were committed to excellence in all things great and small. From custodial services, to worship services, from the nursery to potlucks. Everything they did reflected thoughtfulness and intelligence, kindness and excellence. People make up their minds to come back in the first four to seven minutes of their visit. Did you know that? You know, there are a lot of people that do research on churches, church growth, church development, so on and so forth. And that's one of the things that they say. Visitors that visit a church know within the first four to seven minutes if they're going to come back. If parking is a hassle, if it's difficult to know where the bathrooms are and then the bathrooms are not clean when they're found, if classes start late and teachers are poorly prepared, if we look like we're not aiming very high in what we do, if, if, you know, if Mathis Brother Furniture Store does a better job of welcoming and facilitating their customer's visit to their showroom than we in facilitating our visitor and our members' time with us, then there's always going to be more people at the Mathis Brothers store buying chairs and stuff than people worshiping Almighty God. People naturally want to be associated with someone or something of excellence. If we want people to visit often and eventually stay, we need to improve the quality of our service and the quality of our services. Step number six, they designed an inclusive ministry system. A growing church needs to expect that every member will be involved in church life and service in one way or another. Think about it. 50%, never more in 10 years, never more than 50% of the people have come to Bible class. Well, what do we expect? Half the church, half the church does not receive instruction, in-depth instruction in God's word. Well, don't ask, well, how come we're not growing? How come people are not reaching out? How come people are not trying stuff? How come people are not walking by faith? How come marriages are in trouble? How come this and how come that? Well, uh, if you don't study the Bible, how can you live a Christian life of excellence? Southeastern has very much like ourselves, a very well-defined way of organizing and training their people for working. When every member is expected and trained for service, there's a greater sense of ownership and participation in the mission of the church. In the ministry model that we here at Choctaw use, based on Acts chapter two, the basic philosophy of ministry is that uh, the more effective that we become in the five biblical areas of ministry, what are they? Evangelism, education, fellowship, worship, service. The better we get at those five things, the more souls the Lord is going to add to the church. 
Acts 2.47. My personal ministry goal is that I could look at every name in our church directory and know that each name there is responsible for some type of minister or another. In other words, I open, we used to have it in a book, now we've got it online. I go to the directory on the webpage, the Choctaw webpage, and I start with A, Abel, you know, and I go all the way to Z, and I can go through every name and every family. Oh yeah, yeah, he cuts the grass. Oh yeah, she takes care of this. They deliver food to people. This fellow here is often uh, leading communion. This person's a giver, a liberal giver uh, that enables us to support missionaries. Oh yeah, this guy, I know what he does, but whatever. You know, I remember I preached at a black church uh, uh, many years ago uh, where Brother uh, Crenshaw, who's passed away recently, uh, Arnelius Crenshaw preached and he invited me to go preach there. <clears throat> and they had a deacon, <laughs> they had a deacon. And you know what his job was? His job was to put a decanter, a very lovely decanter, and they didn't cheap out, they, a decanter of fresh ice water and a clean glass on the pulpit for the speaker, whoever that speaker was. And that deacon did his job, I mean, you know, he didn't just run up and plop the thing down and go away, oh no. No, it, it was like being served at the Ritz, you know? He came up, you know, with the little towel thing on his, and he wiped down the decanter and set it, and, you know, he set the handle so it would be handy for the preacher or whoever was to grab the handle and he took the glass and you know, gave it a wipe, you know, made sure it was okay, you know, and then he, he went and sat with the other deacons. That was his job. But you'd think that the whole service depended on that one act alone. And if I was looking through the directory and I saw his picture, I'd say, oh yeah, he's the guy that puts the water up. That's the goal that I have for the church. When this happens, we'll be on our way to becoming a, a mega church of uh, unlimited growth potential. And then finally, number seven, they made welcoming visitors a priority. There's no shortage of people who are searching for answers, spiritual answers to their questions and problems. Many people come here on their own or they're invited by a friend or family member or they come because of Bible talk. They just want to see you know, this thing, Bible talk. Who is that guy? Where does, he, where, does he, uh, where does he go to church? They're always surprised to find out that he, he, the Bible talk guy uh, preaches for a church in a place that nobody ever heard of. Choctaw, where's that? The way that visitors are treated from the moment they see the information on the website or they receive an invitation to come or they drive into the parking lot from this moment uh, to the first six months with us. These experiences will determine if they will stay or leave. If they stay, it'll determine what kind of Christian that they will become. At Southeastern, every single step of that journey from parking in the parking lot to a visitor welcoming meeting to Bible studies and training in ministry, every single step for their first six months was all planned out in advance. Every step planned out in advance. The common denominator shared by all churches experiencing dynamic numerical growth is that each one of them has a well-defined plan of action for the crucial first six months of church life so that nobody falls through the cracks. No one leaves through the back door because of neglect. Now you might not like the preaching, Or the air conditioning may be too high or too low for you. You know, that's fine. But if you don't come back because you were neglected, 
That's on us. Amen? That, that's on us. So this time of year, you know, is the time for review and assessment. You know, there's the State of the Union address by the President and the State of the State address by the Governor and the, even the State of the City address by the, by the Mayor. So this morning, you know, uh, we've had the State of the Church sermon by, by one of the uh, preaching staff. After 11 years of uh, work and observation, I see that basically as a church, we are doing what we have, we are doing what we have to do. We're doing what's been set before us. And that's a good thing. But if someone said, you know, what are we doing as a church? Answer, we're maintaining the status quo. That's what we're doing. The objection or the objective rather for the future, however, should be to try something challenging, try something where the bar is set higher because there's really not too much stretching of our faith at the rate that we're going at now. It's easy now, it's easy. I've talked to you about this other church in order to give you a real life example of a church resembling ourselves and where they've set the bar and how with God's help they reached what seemed an impossible goal. No one person can decide on behalf of an entire congregation, a congregation. but if enough individuals make personal decisions to aim high to, to make those big, hairy, audacious goals, then God will reward our faith in ways that we, can e we can't even imagine now. I want God to bless me in ways that I can't even imagine. I want the church to grow in ways that I can't even imagine now, that only God could see. But that will never happen if our goal is simply to maintain the status quo. So I invite each of you, my brothers and my sisters, to let go the safety of your comfort zones and aim high for your spiritual lives, for your service to God, for your family life, for your married life, for your personal conduct, and also, yes, Aim high for your church life as well. And if this decision moves you to come for prayer or for baptism at this moment, then we encourage you to do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.